when we're looking at different various hyaluronic acid fillers, they each have different characteristics. And this is their molecular structure. This is what they're made of. Yep. So when we are putting these into patients' faces or wherever we want to put these, we need to know everything about this product before we inject it in a patient. We need to know the hyaluronic acid content. How much hyaluronic acid does this filler have? Some of them have 17, some of them have 20, some have 23, 24. So milligrams per ml is what I'm talking about. So if you have one that is around 20 milligrams per ml, your filler, um, that is usually in that Restylane family, those are commonly 20 milligrams per ml. That means that it is net neutral. When I say that, it means that it doesn't absorb water. There's not enough hydro, um, hyaluronic acid in it that will absorb it into the gel and make it bigger than when you put it in. So some of the Juvederm products have more hyaluronic acid. When you put them in, they absorb more water and they just get more fluffy as time goes on. Not a bad thing. A lot of people love to use that in lips and such. Mm -hmm. So just know those properties. A lot of them have less than 20 milligrams. That means they're not going to swell either. They're not going to shrink, but they're not going to swell. Mm -hmm. So the other part of it is cross-linking. Yep. Like Dr. Kwok was talking about cross-linking. We have different amounts of crossing. We could have 1%. We could have none. We could have 5 We could have 7%. So some of these products have different amounts of cross-linking. I want you to think of cross-linking as a fishnet. And that fishnet might only have a couple little strings. So think of that as like a little 2 or 3% cross-link, or 4 or 5. Not a lot. And that'll stretch a lot. You put a fish in there, those fish in there, it's going to stretch a lot. If you get more cross-linking, add a few more strings. Say this is 6%. It doesn't stretch quite as much. Then you go up to 8%, and then you have more strings, and it doesn't stretch as much. So it's going to give you more stability and less elasticity or stretchability to that product the more you increase the cross-linking. So it's going to be, and there are a lot of variables in cross-linking too. I'm just kind of giving you a generality of stretchability in, in general. Yep. And then particle That's, size. Oh, particle size. Particle size is important. Um, unfortunately, I'd probably say there's only one one filler company that has a patent really right. on particle size um, and it's only within the NASHA so the wrestling family is the one that has the NASHA products that actually have a particulate size particle size does matter I mean ultimately the bigger the particles the bigger like boulders compared to if you have a lot more of a smaller particle because they've meshed through it um, you had a little sandy type of products you know building on top of it versus building on boulders you can get much more lifting capacity off of bigger boulders versus you pouring sand on top of each other so particle size is going to be important um, some of the um, companies do run it through a meshing system to get a little bit more uniformity so that there is a little bit more uniformity in their particle sizes um and ultimately majority of them what you have to realize and i think it goes into the actual making of the gels is some of them like the nasha ones that we're talking about majority of them in the particular are a little bit more what i call a firm gel versus the other gels majority of them on the marketplace are a little bit more of a fluid type of a gel it's a little bit more like snot yeah, yeah. stretchy <laughs> it's like flam. stretchy phlegmy <laughs> snot so when you try and particulate particulate that that doesn't really actually form into really particles it's more of a um a fluidity of uh, the same size of particles that are flowing through that through the area and are stabilizing the area. So particle size does matter. I think it, in my hands, I think it, it really, really um, determines how much lifting it, you can get off of it, how much you can build off of it without it moving or uh, losing its structure. So I think that's where particle size does impo is important. Elasticity, cohesivity mm -hmm. is important as well. It has to do with how much flexibility, how much stretch it is. Um, that that goes into um, the characteristic of integration of a product in my in my books is, mm -hmm. you know, you have a product that you want to place more superficially. Well, you don't want it to have so much uh, of a firmness to it that it doesn't flex and stretch because as you're moving, you want something to flex and stretch so that you don't see the product moving up and down with movement. You may want to use those firmer ones down below. 
a little bit more flexibility, a little more stretch, you could probably place it a little bit more superficial. So you have a little bit more elasticity, a little bit more cohesivity. And that has to do with other different particle. Um, uh, I think it has to do with sometimes when they're making it light chains, heavy chains, mm -hmm. how well tightly cross-link it is. And it's not necessarily even the amount of cross-linking, but how much they put the cross-links together. And so that's where, you know, you, we, it, delves into figuring out and pl and one of the things you need to make sure you do is play with all these products as much as we're going through all of these you still need to play with it see how it reacts in patients um tissues see what kind of outcomes you get with regards to the artistry of what you're expecting you know we can always say these are the components but when you do your real life patient does that correlate with what your expectation is of what this product should play in the patient's face should be. And so sometimes you may, you may decide, Hmm, you know that I, I didn't need as much elasticity cohesivity. I needed more particle size. I needed more cost cross thinking. I needed less hyaluronic acid content. So this is where now your mind is starting to balance out <laughs> like a scale <laughs> a myriad. Um, yeah. of what you want out of your product so you can inject it correctly. Right. And then a couple of other little ones are presence of lidocaine. The majority of our products nowadays have lidocaine, the majority of them. Um, but you need to know G prime. So what is G prime? G prime is the lifting capacity that a filler has. Mm -hmm. So how much will it, how much tissue will it hold up? If you have a really low G prime product, something very, very soft, and you put it deep, it's just going to squish out and go flat. Mm -hmm. If you want to put something deep on the bone, you want something that's going to have structure that's going to kind of help lift the tissue above it up. So you need to to pick a, a product that has the G prime that's going to be appropriate for the layer of tissue that you're going to be putting it in. If it's got a medium G prime and it's stretchy, well, sometimes that's really good in many places in the in the super in the sub Q area. Yep. If it's something that doesn't stretch and it's got a high G prime, go deeper. Yep. So we want you to take this information away. Take a picture of it, whatever you can. But we want you to when someone brings a new product to you, <clears throat> we want you to, to um, someone says, hey, it's the latest and greatest. You can put this everywhere. It works everywhere. You need to ask them, what's the hyaluronic acid content? What's, is it, does it stretch? Um, is it, is, what's the G prime on it? And what's the cross-linking? So all of those will give you an idea in your mind of kind of where it fits on a chart that we're going to show you. Where does it fit on this chart? And where is it kind of like other things I've used? And then play with it if you want. Mm -hmm.